What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. And on The Stack, we talk about comics and we review them. And that's the pitch. Exactly. That's exactly right. And we're going to do that despite the <laughs> trying times out in the world. What a great time to sit at home and read a comic. Yeah, we probably should get out of the way. A lot of people are sick. Pete is sick. He's Boo, still alive, though. He's still alive, and we, he doesn't think... We don't think he has the coronavirus. No. He just has a regular, disgusting virus. <laughs> right. But we asked him yesterday. We, we were talking to him last night, and he, he said he didn't have a fever. Yeah. So our professional medical opinion is... The podcasters are the doctors of the future. <laughs> exactly. Because we have no problem sharing opinions despite uh, not having any sort of knowledge base. <laughs> exactly. Here's something we do have a knowledge base about, which is comic books. Let's jump into it with a big one from Marvel Comics Cable. Number one, written by Jerry Dugan and art by Phil Noto. This, of course, is new Kid Cable. Kid young, Cable. Young Keep it young, Cable. Young, MC fresh. Cable, yep. if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, hanging out on Krakoa, getting into adventures and having a good old time. Uh, this, I'll, I'll just get this out of the way. I, uh, Kid Cable still doesn't sit right with me. Like, I don't have a problem with him, but it's just, I watch it. I'm like, what is the connection to your old Cable here? Mm. Uh, which is fine. Yeah. But it feels like a whole new fresh character. I me. mean, it sort of is, uh, in a lot of ways. He's still the son. It makes more sense in some ways that he's, uh, the son. He's a summer son. Right. Uh, Cyclops' dad. Um, so, and I guess Madeline Pryor is still his mom. Uh, so he's still in that same role, and now he is that kid, but he has like just as much fighting prowess and experience as all the other right. X-Men. And like a lot of the X-Men on Krakoa, he's uh, getting his fuck on, Yeah, is he's basically what's happening in this issue. And good on you. You know, get out there. <laughs> That's put, what you're supposed to do. Put yourself out there. It's rule number three. It, was it? I thought it was rule number one. Oh, maybe. Make more mutants. Uh, rule was number, number three one? is no smoking. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's good. The Krakoa is an island location. Yeah. Uh, There's a big sign when you get to Krakoa. It says, no shirt, no shoes, no service. <laughs> so far, Wolverine yeah. hasn't made it in. No shirt, no shoes, fuck someone. <laughs> Which is the sign in front of my local bar. <laughs> yes, Jimmy Buffett's, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, Margaritaville. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, I think this is fun. Um, and I really like the way the story's told and the stuff that happens at the end which sort of sets up. Yes. Because it felt like the main story was a little bit like, here's the kind of, it wasn't a lot of plot. It was just like sort of a, almost a one shot. Yeah, it's a fun lark. I mean, uh, to get into spoilers here, it's essentially, uh, what's the story of like the lion with the thorn in its... I think it's the lion and the thorn <laughs> is the traditional story. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it's basically that, but with Cable and a bunch of mutants, which is super fun. Like yeah. it's, the Phil Dodo's art is amazing. And the creatures that he draws here, a young mutant gets uh, wanders away, goes onto the monster side of the island because yeah. Krakoa fucked another island. And Krakoa just following the rules. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Rule number three, I think. Yep, okay. I think one. Uh, I don't know. Two. All. I mean, let's be honest. All the rules are have sex. <laughs> yes. Uh, make more Pro mutants. No smoking, but fuck. Professor X is a horny little bald he guy. Is. He's like, I want to watch you and put your memories in my head. And <laughs> yeah, little, little, creep. little ball I'm wearing. What do you head. think he's watching underneath that mask? Yeah, pornography. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so young mutant wants to run to the other side of the island. They go to rescue him. It does become the Lion and the Thorn story, uh, but with uh, monsters. I thought there was going to be some sort of take on it, right. but it was not. No, it was not. legit. The Thorn was a sword, which is fun. And again, it sets up something at the end, but... Right. So is the sword... Maybe I needed to read more about this. There is the event that's coming up, which I guess technically is called Ten of Swords, but fuck yes. them, it's called X of Swords. Yes. Uh, and by fuck them, I mean these talented, nice people, many of whom we know. And respect. Yes. <laughs> so they're setting up this event. Is this setting that up, or is it just coincidentally Cable is getting a sword? Uh, it felt coincidental to me, but it's probably not. Right. Um... Because what I liked about this is he gets this cool sword, and he's like, this is just a cool sword, no problem, no stakes here. And then we cut to a little uh, sort of epilogue where um, this group of people in space are like, we got to get that sword back. Yeah, it's a bunch of uh, space knights, like yeah. Rom, I guess. Though. Yeah. I guess uh, Rom is over at IDW now. It's not. The name of the space knight is 
e- is slightly different. It's right. like Ewan or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and th- I thought you were talking about the other epilogue that happens in the issue. That's which, the one I, I like yeah. both of them. But that one I thought was cool because I, I think Cable, one of Cable's things is he has one foot firmly in X-Men continuity because of uh, Executioner song and all of his origin story. Uh, but one foot in like future space, like weird things yes. that are slightly tangential. So I think this is a cool move. And then an even cooler move in the second epilogue where we have old cable who I enjoyed seeing. Yes, me too. It was very yeah. refreshing. This is what I'm saying is that like kid cable is super fun in this issue. I, yeah. I guess we just call him Cable or Teen Cable or whatever. But yeah. he's having a great time. It's a fun lark. It's a fun streaming. adventure. He's streaming. As you mentioned, the, yeah, he's streaming. Uh, old Cable is broadcast. Exactly. Oh, I see the joke. Cord I, cutter. Yeah, you got, got it. it. Okay, took me a second. <laughs> no problem. Maybe you have the virus. <laughs> I don't have a fever, so yeah. medically? Yeah. Um, I think you're, yeah, you're fine. Okay. And again, I'm a podcaster, so I get it. Thanks, Doc. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Old Cable showing up, though, is very pleasing. And to me, that made the whole thing more worth it because to your point, Cable is always mixed up in insane mind-bending time travel stuff where it's like, oh, I did that three months from now yeah. and that's going to affect me three months ago. Yeah. And you're like, I don't get this, but I'm enjoying it anyway. Yeah. And that's what that sets up at the end and I think it's so smart. And also he's in hell though too, right? So there's a sort of... Uh, oh, is he in hell? There's a demonic side to it as well, okay. which I was... Like, oh, that's even another frontier for this story. So Right. Anyway, lots going on, uh, yeah. but it, for the most of it, a fun X-Men adventure, which is nice and refreshing. And definitely pick it up. Even if you don't know anything about Cable, you can jump right in uh, because, hey, this is the streaming era of Cable and his bubble is about to burst. Well, okay, good. Now you're on board. <laughs> Moving over to DC Comics Hill House, The Dollhouse Family, number five, written by M.R. Carey and art by Peter Gross. Very excited to talk about this, not with Pete, who consistently is very uncomfortable talking about this book. Yep. Because he doesn't like dollhouses. Oh, they scare him. Yeah. We could have a, he has a lot of things he's scared of, as we learned on across our many podcasts. Yes. Dollhouses. Right. Um, wells. Yes. Um, commitment. Commitment. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Uh, This book is about an evil dollhouse that seems to have some sort of black demonic force powering it that absorbs people over time. We've seen a bit of its history as it's gone, but it seems to be pursuing one woman in particular that has rejected the dollhouse several times. The last issue, the dollhouse took her daughter. Yeah. Uh, And now she is going on the offensive. She is trying to find her daughter. Then to do that, she finally goes back in her own history and tries to figure out where the dollhouse comes from. So big revelation revelations of this issue and i think they were worth the wait yeah i agree um i like this this book a lot particularly this issue which really solidifies it as it feels like a vertigo book from like 10 8 8 10 years ago it has yeah. like very strong vibes of the dreaming the uh series from before uh or even some sandman elements like it's it's nice and uh but also sort of Stephen King E in uh, in its way and well, I would say now that you mentioned the Sandman thing, I wonder if this started as a House of Mystery pitch or something like yeah. that, and then just morphed over time because it's houses. Yeah, it's there from you that go. Extended house. Aren't there a couple of them? There's the House of Mystery and there's House of Secrets. House of those Secrets. Are the two yeah. Cain and Abel live in those. Right, and this is the House of Dolls. Uh, house of Dolls. Uh, yes. And also, like, uh, we find out that the dollhouse was made from a placenta, like all dollhouses. Right, exactly. That's how I made a uh, dollhouse for my children. Yes, good. Just they love horrifying. playing with it. Yeah. And I'm, every time I remind them, I pass by, like, that was your placental. <laughs> <laughs> and ah, and they like, scream. Oh, thanks, Dad. I love That's you. That's a family connection that you you got to maintain. This book is great. This is not an easy one to jump right in on, certainly. Uh, but definitely go back and read the first four issues of the series because it's so good. Now let's talk about my favorite issue of the week Ooh. from Image Comics, Stealth Number 1, written by oh. Mike Costa and art by Nate Belgard. I'm almost hesitant to talk about this book at all yeah. because it was such a incredible surprise. Well, let's talk about what maybe we thought it was going to be right? Um, and then not say what it is. Yes. Because um, I think I agree with you. The... Um, the story is so well done and it was such a pleasant surprise. Yeah. Um, Cause it, the way reading it, it reminded me of like uh, a, a normal, like here's a new superhero. Um, he yeah, is it's very violent. Wi- it's very wild storm. Yes. To me. While it felt like early image, uh, like shadow Hawk, even if you remember mm-hmm. that doesn't age well, that title, <laughs> uh, but it was just like someone who has a regular job, 
fights crime at night, and that's where they sort of get out their right. aggression. And he has an armor that's like, I don't know exactly what this armor does, but it seems to do a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's like Darkhawk, basically. Exactly. Uh, so reading that, it, it's very, like, to your point, you know exactly what it is going in. You get this kid. He's uh, taking care of his dad, who seems to be suffering from dementia. He's working uh, Peter Parker style. Mm-hmm. He had a journalist job. I think he has an internship. Uh, no, right? it's, a, it's a job, it's a job. but, it, but okay. they're, they're cutting back, and he's writing these articles that are not what they want, and it feels like he's... He even says, like, hey, I need more time on this article because, like, I'm just getting... It's all very negative because he's writing about yeah. the city falling... It takes place in Detroit, the city falling apart and all this stuff, and you feel... Uh, like he's oh, and then he goes out and fights crime, and that's how he sort of right. resets. Yeah, it's very and Rorschach narration at the beginning, yeah. where like the pestilence of the city crawling out. A very funny bit, also when his editor is like, "This was supposed to be a three hundred word art review." Yeah, he's like, "Ah, it's not quite working for me." Yeah, which reminded me of my least favorite trope in TV and movies, where there are reporters who are like, "I'm gonna go rogue and do whatever," and they're like, "Don't do that," and then they do it anyway. Like. uh uh, what's his name? Superman oh. in Batman v Superman when he was a sports writer and he's like, I'm going to investigate these crimes with this bat criminal who's killing people over in Gotham. <laughs> and Perry's like, please don't do that. That's not your job. And he's like, I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm like, okay, I'm the boss. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't stop him because he's Superman and he'll he, kill us. He knew the whole time. He snaps necks all the time. Neck breaker. Oh, jeez. And the S stands for don't correct me, you sucker. So Nate uh, Belgard's art is is very good, very solid superhero art across yeah. the board. Uh, Mike Costa's writing exactly captures that flavor. And then there is a turn at a certain point in the book that elevated it completely yeah. for me. Uh, I I know this was based on something by Robert Kirkman that he wrote. There was, a, I guess, a one-shot. I missed that, so I don't know if the same plot events happened mm. in there. Uh, but not knowing anything about it going in... So good. Yeah. I'm very excited to see where this goes going forward. It's a good pickup. It's yeah. a good issue. All right. Before we move on, we're going to have a little bit of a break, and then we'll oh. be right back. Hey, Alex here. Remember that feeling when you'd subscribe to comics, get one in the mail, and it felt like you were receiving solid gold? Well, what if you could get that feeling, but with actual gold? Thanks to this week's sponsor, Acre, you can. Acre is the new subscription platform for gold. Acre lets you make small monthly payments and then sends gold straight to your doorstep every few months. You subscribe to comics, right? Uh, And maybe someday you'll sell them if the paper doesn't dissolve and the staples don't fall out. It's expensive, unlike Acre, which is affordable. You don't have to pay out of your pocket all at once. It's convenient. Just set up the subscription and forget about it. And you will get, no joke, physical gold bars mailed to your doorstep. Acre branded gold is of the highest quality, designed in California and minted in Switzerland, my favorite state and favorite country, respectively. It's safe and simple with gorgeous packaging and excellent customer service. And here's how it works. You subscribe for just $50 a month. That's right. No need to break the bank. Start buying gold for just $50 a month. And there's even a $30 per month option even less breaking of the bank. Then you watch your gold grow. It's like watching that stack of unread comics grow dangerously next to your bed. Except guess what? Acre will keep you updated on your gold stash as you make progress. And once your gold stash reaches the price of 2.5 grams Acre gold bar, they will discreetly ship you your gold. Most of all, you're in control. You can easily cancel or modify your plan to suit your needs at any time. No epic crossovers where you have to buy all the issues. Just gold, gold, gold. Find out more by going to the link in our show notes and start your Acre Gold subscription today. Okay, right back into it with Marvel Comics. Star Wars Bounty Hunters, number one, written by Ethan Sachs and art by Paola Villanelli. Uh, This, of course, is tying into everybody's favorite bit of Star Wars lore, uh, Galaxy's Edge over in Disneyland and Disney World. Oh. Yeah, Uh, they go to Batu. Oh, fun. Yeah, it was fun. Bad too. So you've written on this? Uh, no, I haven't been to Batu. Oh, okay. No. Uh, no, I'm just the. the yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm talking about. I know, but I, I thought maybe you had. Oh, no, I haven't hand. been there. I'm uh, not rich. Okay, wow. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and of course, all of this extends from a one uh, cutaway scene in Empire Strikes Back. Yes. Uh, where we meet a couple of bounty hunters, and now here they are in their own adventure. Right. Uh, I did have to check several times after they did that Batu scene that this wasn't one of the Galaxy's Edge books that they did at Marvel. Uh. But I think it's its own thing based on the back matter. Yeah. Uh, it is exploring the bounty hunters. Boba Fett does show up. All the other ones show up. Bosk. Sure. There you go. Others. Yes. Uh, a robot. Yeah, I a think. robot. Mm-hmm. They're, that's what they're called, robots? I believe droid. Sure, I don't know. Term. I've never seen those movies. Um, I'm not a nerd. Wow. Uh, you've never seen them. Cool. <laughs> Weird to brag about that now. Yeah, da, 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 da. I'm wearing a Star Wars shirt right yep, now. I'm I, showing you. There we go. Never stop. I thought yeah. you were just showing me your bare chest. <laughs> okay, power play. <laughs> Listen, my shirt came up with my sweater yeah. when I was lifting it. Weird move. It was uh, very weird, uncomfortable. Uh, weird flex. Oh, no right. flex. Um, I also have Star Wars uh, shaved into my <laughs> chest. <here. laughs> yeah. Again, very evocative. Either way, it Please works. don't. I'm officially traumatized by seeing it and then having you describe yes. it to me. So Star Wars Bounty Hunters, uh, this takes place like the rest of the Star Wars titles right now, right after Empire Strikes Back. So Boba Fett still got Han on board yeah. in the Carbonite, takes a little side trip. We get some flashing forward, flashing back. Uh, and Ethan Sachs, I believe, has been writing the Wasteland stuff, the like old land Logan spinoff stuff mm-hmm. that's been happening, which has been pretty good. Yeah. So this has a lot of that flavor to it. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, action happening here. It's a little bit chaotic. It was hard yes. for me to really latch on to a character and be like, okay, I know to like this person, and now I can figure out what the sort of story is going to uh, go around or be motivated by. Um, so, yeah, I, that's, I guess, where I, where I was with it. It was uh, a little bit chaotic. Uh, I agree. I think that came, honestly, a little more from the art than the writing. Like, it felt a little cramped. Uh, maybe there was too much dialogue going on, but... I I like the idea of the scuzzy underworld of Star Wars and exploring that. They did yeah. that really effectively in The Mandalorian. I yeah. think that's exactly what that was. Uh, but here, there's a lot of those characters in Star Wars that, like the side characters that people create, where it's like, I don't know, that's some dude with a faceplate. I don't know who that is. Yeah. Uh, where, to your point, I think it would be better if it just focused on Boba Fett. And when it comes down and just focuses on him, or it focuses on any one of the other characters, I think it's much more promising. Yeah, agreed. Uh, next one to talk about, a much more sparse issue from DC Comics, The Batman's Grave, number six, written by Warren Ellis, art by Brian Hitch. This title is so good every it's, single month. It's so good. If you're someone who like really loves Batman, but is like uh, the a little bit thrown off by... Like, like what the continuity shift between Tom King and James Tynan's uh, run, or like if you're like, oh, I just crave like a, a good Batman story. Like this is a great book. Like yeah. it's Batman. And I don't mean it's just like boilerplate Batman. It's just like great dialogue, great Batman Alfred exchanges throughout every one of these issues. Like it's such a good book. Uh, yeah, I agree. So in this issue, uh, Batman and Commissioner Gordon, I don't know if he's commissioner yet. He's this, just Gordon, I think. Because yeah, they're Gordon. like, they're fighting with each other. They don't, right. They're not getting along. Yeah, I, I thought, I didn't realize this took place earlier in continuity when they're kind of just meeting each other because they seem, there's an exchange later on where Gordon's like, wait, how do you have my number? Well, I love that. He's like, look, why do you, I, I could just call you. I don't need to keep turning the light on every couple hours when I need you. And he's like, eh, sorry, no. And then he's like, oh, you got my fucking number? <laughs> you calling me? So they're battling through Arkham Asylum uh, versus a ton of, it seems to be lobotomy thugs, Yeah, I guess, uh, is part of this greater mystery that Batman has been looking into. And as you mentioned, there's a real good uh, Batman-Alfred scene at the end. Um, it's so good. This, to me, feels like the template for... I mean, maybe I say worst when it wouldn't even be worst, but like a Batman anime on Netflix or something like that. But mm. at best, like a, a weekly Batman mystery series. Oh, yeah. You know, like I know we have Batwoman. I know we have the Hourverse shows. But this to me feels like this is Batman off solving mysteries. Every episode he checks in with Alfred. Every episode he checks in with Gordon. Like it. It feels almost English mystery show to me in yeah. a way. And that's uh, what you want. Yeah, and that's what I want. In, in a Batman and English mystery show. Just a what very if, polite Batman. What if they made Batman like really young, and they had like oh. focused on having Alfred be like the right, like before he was Batman. Yeah, I'm not even Alfred though. Like Alfred would be cool, but what if it focused on Gordon before he got a mustache? 
Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I we would want to know like how the mustache came about. Right, that would be interesting, particularly if and, uh, every single time he had a mustache, he was like, oh, "I hate this mustache." Yeah, exactly. And the got rid of it. I know. Oh, like in a fun. really fucking annoying way to the fans. <laughs> yeah, throws them nuts. <laughs> okay, sinister. I mean, that's my thing. I was I was very upset about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this title is great. Uh, Batman's Grave, definitely pick it up. And uh, the art by Brian Hitch. I mean, the action is ludicrous. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. It's so fluid. Uh, last one to talk about, and this is a big, wild, crazy <laughs> yeah. one. Decorum, number one from Image Comics. Words by Jonathan Hickman and art by Mike Huddleston. Oh, boy. If uh, you've been reading the X Men comics, and sure. you're like these are good, but I need more charts. I need more yep. like backstory about stuff. I have no idea what it is. Yeah, this is the book for you. Yes. and that is maybe it comes across as a criticism, but if you are a fan of Hickman being Hickman, this is like high octane Hickman. This right. is like top shelf tequila Hickman mm. uh, because it is. There's so much going on. There's a bunch of different scenes in different places with characters you don't know anything about. Uh, a bunch of like planets and types of space are established where you're like, oh, okay, I got you. That's where the singularity, uh, the church of the singularity <laughs> is based. Cool. Uh, it's near wild space, but um, not quite as close to the uh, center. Well, uh, but add in that Mike Huddleston's art, which is phenomenal throughout. Very good. Uh, varies from fully painted yeah. panels to just black and white sketches, sometimes on the same page and back and forth and all over the place to flesh out this world. It's it's wild reading yeah. this book. And I really like the, the way the art goes. It gives it a dreamlike quality, especially the uh-huh. sort of first block of the story before they get into a lot of the text stuff. Um, it feels very dreamlike and very like, oh, uh, you're just sort of being washed over with these images from this world. And like there are the, you don't quite know the action, what's happening. It seems like there's this man flanked by two warriors who's going through looking for something and killing people in his wake. There's a, the backstory is that there's all these habitats that are created for uh, species that aren't ready to be part of this uh, galactic empire, basically. And they were allowed to develop, and some of them went well, some of them went poorly. We get this whole uh, almost like explorer from like, well, like it's Christopher Columbus Yeah, we get like ashore. space conquistadors yeah. going after space natives uh, and fighting with laser guns. Uh, eventually some sort of crystal diamond head type thing comes in yeah. and destroys everybody in yeah. a bl- very bloody manner. And it's like, man, we got to get more of these pyramids. Find the pyramids. And it's right. like, find the pyramids. And then it switches into a story of a courier who gets involved in a mob war yeah. that, as far as you can tell, has nothing to do with what happened in the first thing, but of course does. And I will say, like, that story was great. I love... Yeah. Hickman's a, a, a master at least, like telling complex stories and he still even though it's like so much information you hook into these characters where you're like oh i get what these two characters are i get the relationship and i see what at least this part of the story is going to be going forward so i liked it despite yeah. the fact that it's like a big old meal yeah i i love this book too i mean I, one thing that is kind of funny about it is it's i think 59 pages long mm-hmm. uh but getting into it i was like uh, that's all right. A lot of them are just going to be pictures of circles, so I, I think we'll yeah. be good. And then there's going to be two-page spreads that just have two words like, the end, yeah. but it's halfway through the book. Or it's in a different language that you can't ever translate. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Which is like, as far as having a thing that you do as a writer, that's ballsy. Yeah. <laughs> Where you're like, oh yeah? Here's a language you've never heard of, and that's an important part of the story. <laughs> right. So uh, the, he does have these tricks he's playing on, but uh, what I liked about Decorum is it feels like it's evolved, right? Yeah. It's not east of west. It's not what he did there. It's not even what he's doing in X Men. It's a step beyond that in terms yeah. of mixing all of these visual and writing ticks and story ideas. And ultimately, like you mentioned, I think it, it's not two stories and it's not going to be two stories. Yeah. But the first one just pummels you with information. And then about 15 or so pages in, it gets to the story about the courier, which is. On the surface, mostly just like a fun action story with some additional yeah. details throughout. There's even a, a recipe in the middle of it, yeah. which is crazy. Uh, but all of these things are like playing with different styles, seeing how they fit together. Sometimes they don't, but at least there's experimentation happening there, and it's very exciting. And I, I mean, I, this to this is I'm making this up in my head, but it feels like he's 
he started writing the X-Men books and was like, oh, I'm beholden to these characters. I have to tell certain types of stories with them. And it has to exist in a continuity. He's like, but what if I take all these ideas that I brought to it and got to tell my own story in my own book and enjoy that? That's what this feels like. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I mean, I think one would argue that he's getting a little bit of free reign with the X Men as well. Like, definitely. Really, you think that? Just a little bit. No, you don't think the editorial is like, no, I want that island to fuck another. Island. <laughs> yeah. This is editorially <laughs> bad dating. Yeah, we're launching a Disney Plus series on <laughs> islands that fuck each other, and we need to establish a storyline. Kurt Russell's <laughs> islands that fuck each other. It's a reality <laughs> series. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know some of those Hawaiian islands have fucked each other. Absolutely. Come on. That's why they keep spewing it into the atmosphere oh, and stuff. Okay. That's too you far? Always Did I take it, it too I far? took it too far. Just too visceral. I'm sorry. Okay. Now we'll move it to Hulu. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, anyway, this book is incredible. And like we mentioned, a completely full meal of a book. So definitely pick it up. And that is it. If you want to support us, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the People's Improv Theater Loft in New York. Come on by and we will chat with you about comic books. What do you want to plug? Uh, why don't you follow us on Twitter uh, at Comic Book Live, and you can find us on Facebook, too, where we also exist. <laughs> oh, very cool. <laughs> ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and more. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice. And on iTunes in particular, please leave us a comment. Those help us out quite a bit. And we'll see you at the comic book shop. Uh, get better, Pete. And until then, please, I don't want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Every Tuesday night, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once a week, they'll blow your